So we, we planned our vacation a couple a year ago, and we, we don't get to go to these places, but for her parents, um, want to take her grandkids. Does any grandparents in the room want to take their grandkids on, some, on a vacation, right? So if they, we just get to go, but they want to take their grandkids, and we just happen to be the ones, once they get old enough, I don't think they're going to leave us behind. Uh, so since we love the heat, we thought, man, what better place to go than Caliente, California? Caliente is, for Spanish, is hot. And so we decided in the middle of summer, let's go to a place that's called hot. And so <laughs> it, is gonna, it was very scary because we were going up there thinking, oh, this is going to be great. But we were going to a dude ranch. Have you ever been to a dude ranch? Anybody ever been to a dude ranch? A dude ranch is when you get to ride horses, and apparently they have child care. I didn't know that, but that was amazing. That was like the best part. Uh, they, they like take the kids, and then we just get to like sit by the pool. I was like, this is the best vacation ever. She's like, next year we'll go to Hawaii. And I was like, no, we're coming back here. This is great. <laughs> So we go horseback riding, make memories with the kids. I absolutely loved it. So I got a picture for you. Let's see if we got, there it is. Got the picture of the kids on the horse. They loved it so much. And uh, that's, that's her dad there. Um, and the, the family didn't go on that one. You can kind of choose which ones you want to go to. But that was our family going on a dude ranch. It was pretty amazing, Caliente, California. What a blessing it was. Uh, a ranking ranch if you ever want to go. Just shooting, shutting them out, shooting out, shouting them out. Pretty cool. Um, so what happens is they're, they're in a basin. They were there since like 1820, like a long time ago, cattle ranchers. And so here's the, let me show you a picture of the basin. This is the basin right there. Is absolutely, go I took that picture. It's so beautiful. <laughs> I didn't look that on the internet. I, I'm going to uh, frame that in my room because I just love it so much, the memories that we make. But uh, more importantly, th this is a basin that you can, there's a road that goes around little, not very many people live up there. And so I saw this guy, I met this guy there, older gentleman and he, him and his wife, are athletic, and so we were talking. I said, "Have you ever run around?" They go, "Oh yeah, we go every other every other day. We run around that thing." Like, how f how far is that? And, this, and they it's seven miles. So you make the seven mile loop, and they're like, "Oh, we do it every other. We used to be able to do it every day, but now we do it every other." I said, "Oh yeah, yeah, me too." I was like, "Yeah, on my vacation, that's what I love to do." So I had this brilliant idea to waking up early the next day, took a walk, I w walked like a half a mile, and I came back, and I was like, on vacation, look at me, like, this is awesome. And so then we, so then next day, I talked to him again, he goes, he goes, you could do it. And he, I was like, no, I got no shoes, I'm not ready for this, I'm not prepared at all. And he goes, no, you could do it, you could do it. And I was like, you're right, I can do it. <laughs> and so there's two ways we hear ourselves tell stories, right? As we get older, my dad always says, as we get older, we become more and more the hero. And so I'm going to tell you the story one way, and then I'll tell you another way. So the way that I remember the story is I woke up at 4 a.m. It was in the dark. All I had was a flashlight. I ran the seven miles. I was so brave. I came around. I finished like a finish line. I came running home to my wife, and I was like, I, well, she wasn't even awake at that point. But I went, and I was like, nobody's here. Like, this is awesome, but I, I did it. I ran around the whole thing. That's the way I remember it. But that's not how it actually went. Uh, so, like I said, I was not ready. I was not ready to run this thing at all. And so I had these shoes from Costco, like this thin. The sole is like this thin. And so I'm like, I'm going to do this. If he can do it, I'm going to do it. You know that pride, like, if he can do it, I can do it. I haven't run for 10 years. I haven't gotten, a, I don't have the legs for this. So I go out there unready, unprepared, and I run this thing. And I run and I run and I run about, it seems like forever. And I look back and I'm like, the thing's, I am like 5, 0.5 miles away. Like I didn't even run anywhere. I was like, what happened? I started walking. As soon as you start walking, as soon as you slow down, guess what happens? You can hear the surroundings. And all I had, the reason I had all this flashlight, because there's no reception, zero reception. So if I die, it's over. Like I can't call nobody. That's it. So I have this flashlight. All I have is this flashlight. I'm running. And let me show you how dark it is out there. That's what it looked like. That is scary. Like, that, it was so scary. I was so scared. I had this flashlight, and I was just like, I heard. So then I slowed down, started walking. I started walking like this, and I hear some, <laughs> it was a lizard. Like, the lizard. Like, I, I am so scared out of my mind. I'm like, and I start running again. Like, <laughs> so I'm like, let me run faster. And so I run again, I run again, and same thing. Like, I get tired. There's no way. I can't run very far. So I, I, I stop, and I start walking again. And then I go, ow. I'm like, I'm my flashlight. I'm this owl. Like, I'm going to get you. My flashlight is scared out of my mind, like completely scared. And I start running again. And then I start actually, you know what? I don't know if this is divine, but look, this is the scripture that I could remember at the time. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And then I would start running again. Not very far. And then I start walking again. And I start walking. 
I get this flashlight. I hear this going, Poof. like I hear it. And I put my flashlight up, beady eyes, no joke, right in my face. Like, okay, maybe, maybe not that close, but pretty far away. I put the flashlight. It's looking at me. First thing I think is, it's a hyena. It's going to eat me. <laughs> Seriously, I told the story to my wife. I'm like, I'm going to die. And then I realized, wait, I'm in a cattle field. This, this cow's right there. <laughs> this, is, this is cows. This is nothing, nothing to be afraid of. This is cows. So I get the flashlight, start running. The, the sun rises again. And then I go back and I see this beautiful landscape and I start running. And the, the reality is I was scared, so scared. I couldn't run. I hurt my legs. Like for two weeks, I, my leg hurt because my foot was I'm not ready. I was not prepared to run. I was not prepared to run. E.E. E. Cummins says this, fear reveals character. It reveals character. And I was scared. Either way, I was not ready, and yet I finished. Yet I finished because I started and I, and I ran the race. Today, God is using this silly story but even though I was afraid and even though I was not ready, how is he using your story? Even though maybe you're ready or you're not ready. Maybe you're ready and you're excited to go run a seven-mile run, whatever that may be. Maybe it's our small group leaders kicking off and they're like, I don't know if I can do this. I'm not ready. God is going to use your story if you run the race. How will he use your fears and your failures to help you form a story that will bring glory to him? Today, the title of my story, because I have little kids is ready or not, ready or not, ready or not, Jesus is calling. He's calling you. My three points today is ready. The readiness of Rebecca I want to talk about a little bit, not being ready by the disciples, and then what does this mean for me and you? What do these three things mean uh, for me and you, or these two stories? Let's pray as we get going into the Word of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your Word. I can't imagine how blind these, these men in the Bible felt because they didn't have the word of God. They were living the word of God at that moment. And so, Lord, we get the benefit of seeing the sun rise. We get the benefit of seeing your son on that cross and knowing it through the word of God that it is true. You gave us enough evidence to have the faith and believe in who you are. So today I pray that we would, we would get ourselves ready and we'd be willing. Use us for your glory and pray. I pray, I pray the Nigeria team home today, Lord Jesus. And I cheer team, I pray that you would bring them home. We thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. I want to read this scripture verse to you, Mark 8, 34 through uh, 35. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. It's backwards. If we live for ourselves, we'll lose it. If we live for him, we'll gain it. It also says that in some, I, I picked the ESV, but the NIV says that every day you have to pick up your cross. What does that mean? To deny your cross means to deny what I want. To not, what I think is the right path. What I think is God's will. To deny that. Put that aside and get God's will. Let's go to God's will. Deny your cross every day. Deny and take up your cross, I'm sorry. Today I want to talk about Rebecca's story. Preparedness is the word I'm going to talk about, and to, get, to be prepared, this is the, the definition that I looked up, is, is, is it through faith, obedience, and willingness? Through faith, obedience, and willingness, you can be ready. You can be prepared to whatever is upcoming next. I'm not saying you're, you're going to succeed, because even Paul went into a shipwreck, isn't that right? Faith, obedience, and willingness will help you become ready, and we want to ready our hearts for what the Lord is calling us to do. There's three main characters in the story of Rebecca. Uh, Isaac is the son of, you guys know? Jacob, yeah, we hear the word of God, right? Jacob, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I'm sorry, Jacob's son, Isaac's son. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So if without Isaac, or Isaac, where would we be, right? The lineage would be a little bit messed up. So what happened was Abraham, you guys, I don't know if you know the story a little bit, but Abraham was getting old, and the Lord gave Sarah uh, a womb that could bear Isaac. And Isaac came out, and here he is, Isaac, waiting and waiting, just like many of our young men in the room, to find a woman, right? And so what happens is he waits a little too long, and the dad, just like any good dad, wants him to find a wife. So he sends his servant out and to find Isaac, his own wife. And so what happens is we're going to pick up the story where the third character comes in, of course, Rebecca. So we have Isaac and Rebecca, and then we have the third character, the servant. 
The servant is uh, a very dear person to Abraham. He made, before he left, he made him promise. He said, you have to promise me that you're going to come home with a wife for my son. And the reason it's such a big deal is because he's not going to the next town over to get a wife. He, uh, Abraham was in, Can- uh, in Canaan, and he was there, and he was present, and he was doing what the Lord wanted him to do, but he really did not want um, Isaac to marry a Canaanite woman because they don't, they don't believe in one God. They don't have monotheistic thoughts and so that beliefs. And so he sent his servant 500 miles back to Nahor, all the way back, 500 miles And not only that, he wanted to make sure that he came back, so he came back with gifts. It sounds a lot like uh, uh, what happened to my wife. I sent so many gifts, and and I just bribed her to come. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. That's not true. But what happened, Abraham sent all these gifts, 10 camels with all this stuff, to go to Nahor, 500 miles. It's put that in prison. That's a long ways. That's not like you can jump on a plane. He's walking with camels. You're not riding camels. So the 10 camels go, and he goes, and this is where we pick up in our story. Let's read Genesis 24, 15 through 20. Before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the, uh, to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. Then he prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughter of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I, uh, okay, it makes me think he's looking where the, the pretty girls are. Gentlemen in the room, you know, if you're looking for a girl, you got to go where the pretty ladies are, right? And so he's going where the pretty ladies are. May it be when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And so he went to where they who would find a, a lady who's a, a woman of God. He didn't just look anywhere. He went to a small group. Mr. Shafta, <laughs> isn't that right? He went to a small group to find a godly woman. Please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one who you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Man, if I prayed specific prayers like that, do you think we can move some mountains? That's a very specific prayer. Let's see what happens. The servant hurried to meet her and said, please go, uh, please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my Lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar from her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll drink water, uh, I'll draw water for your camels too, until they have had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water and draw enough for all his camels. Analytically, I looked at this story and thought, how much does a camel drink? (laughs) I looked it up, and they're traveling. They drink like 30 gallons at once because they they go without money. My math wasn't good last time I was up here. That's 300 gallons these girls getting in the trough. So the gallons, that's a lot because it's 10 camels. That's amazing obedience. Does anybody have an obedience to help somebody on the side of the road today? With someone, Jesus is calling you, and you don't even, we don't even want to stop and help somebody on the side of the road, let alone feed some random person and give 300 gallons. Let's just, let's just say it's 200 gallons. It's 100 gallons. She went down to the spring, picked up the gallons, and gave it to some stranger and was obedient. That is a woman who was ready. That is a woman who was prepared. He didn't tell her, God told me to give me some water. God told you to give me some water right now so I can take you home with me. No, that would be scary. Don't do that. He prayed a prayer, God answered, and she was ready and prepared. She was ready. Her heart was ready and prepared. And that is what Nahor wanted and prayed for, a woman who was respectable, a woman who had character, a woman who was ready to answer the call. Is there some women and men in this room who are ready to answer the call right now? Because if you're not today, I hope you will be. I hope you will be. I hope you're getting ready every single day, denying Picking up your cross every single day. Let's continue on. 55. So he, she answer, he answers a prayer, right? Or she answers the prayer that he prayed. And then in 55, it goes on to say, But her brother and her mother replied, 
let the young woman remain with us 10 days or so, and you may go. They didn't want to let her go. They loved her. That's good to know. But she, he said to them, do not detain me now that the Lord has granted success on my journey. I don't want to wait another minute. Send me on my way so I may go to my master. Then they said, let's call the young woman and ask her about it. I like that idea. So they called Rebecca and asked her, will you go with this man? And her answer is, would you say it with me? I will go. Say it again. I will go. She said, so they sent their sister Rebecca on her way, along with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, our sister, may, uh, may you increase to thousands upon thousands. May your offspring pro- uh, possess the cities of their enemies. What a beautiful prayer. Man, what a beautiful prayer. And sure enough, man, Rebecca and Isaac living in the promise that, Jesus, that God promised Abraham. I want to um, tell you about someone who was not prepared. So maybe you walk in this room, you're like, well, I'm not prepared. I don't know what that means or what that looks like. So Rebecca was prepared. She was ready to say, I will go. I will do it. And she was willing. So not only was she ready, but she was willing. So I want to talk about two characters in the Bible who were, who were willing, who were, who were not necessarily ready, but we're willing. Me and my wife, every night uh, that we can, we watch a movie together or a show or something. We just get sit down for an hour, and that's our time to kind of watch. Right now, we're in the middle of, I say right now, but it's like been for four years, watching Survivor, because there's like so many episodes. But we watched, we just kind of, and we got done with the season, and we're like, what are we going to do now? And so it's been on my heart for a little bit to do it, but then she brought it up. She goes, let's watch The Chosen. And I'm going to be honest with you. It's my time, right? Prideful me. I want to watch some get away. I read the Bible all day long. I'm helping the interns, and we're doing worship and all stuff. At night, I just want to kind of do whatever I want to do, right? Pridefulness in all of us, right? And me especially. At night, I don't want to do the chosen. It's probably some corny Bible character. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> my resistance to God wanting to use my, uh, get my attention. I like movies. I like pictures. And it's my resistance to, to he wants to speak t- through my language. Isn't that pretty cool? And so my wife says, hey, let's, let's watch The Chosen. So we, we watched The Chosen the last couple of weeks. We got through, see, we're in the middle of season two, so don't ruin anything for us. Um, but I want to show this video. It's, <laughs> um, I want to show these videos, just two-minute two clips, to kind of set up these characters um, so you have an idea. And hopefully, if you haven't watched The Chosen, this will entice you to watch a little bit. The story of Peter and Andrew reminds us of an important readiness And he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. This is where we take off. Put that down for a catch. A little farther out. Uh, I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. We've been doing this all night. Nothing.
Harvey? <laughs> That's awesome. The story of Peter and Andrew reminds us of the importance of readiness in following Jesus. Despite their moments of unpreparedness and weakness, what sets them apart is their willing hearts and their desire to learn and grow in their faith. When Jesus calls them, they respond with obedience and surrender, leaving behind their comfort zones and embracing his divine plan. As we reflect on the story of Simon Peter and Andrew, we are challenged to examine our own readiness to follow Jesus. Are we willing to step out in faith? But when doubts and uncertainties surround us, are we prepared to leave behind the familiar and embark on a journey of discipleship with Jesus? Let us learn from the disciples' example and respond with readiness, trusting that God can use our willing hearts to impact the world in extraordinary ways for his glory. In all of our lives, there's somebody in a white robe you can see in the back there. He was stood up with the dog next to him. He stood up. And in all of our lives, there's someone just like that who's watching your actions, who's watching your motions, who's watching what you say yes to and what you say no to, how you live, how you live according to his word. And in that story, it was Matthew. In the Gospel of Matthew, we encounter the profound account of a tax collector named Matthew. As Jesus walks by, he approaches Matthew at his tax booth, a place where he collected taxes for the Roman government. The scene is remarkable. As Jesus, the Savior of the world, seeks out an ordinary tax collector amidst his daily duties. With compassion in his eyes, Jesus utters two simple yet life-changing words, follow me. A mother of a son with talent like yours should be proud. She's ashamed that I could use the talent that God gave me against God. Next. You're good at something. You found a way to make a living doing it. It's that simple. Must be nice to live in a world so simply ordered. We live in the same world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours? Matthew. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy has done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to... What are you doing? Where do you think you're going? Guys, let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're going to throw it all away. Yes. I don't get it. You didn't get it when I chose you either. But this is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? I grabbed it without thinking. You can put it back. No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? A dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. Oh, man. I love that. I love that. So many of us feel that we are not worthy. We're that tax collector. He's chosen me. 
Without a moment's hesitation, Matthew responds to Jesus' call immediately. In that pivotal instant, he makes a life-altering decision to leave behind everything he had known, his job, his reputation, and perhaps even his friends. To follow the one who saw beyond his occupation and into the depths of his heart. Matthew's story is a powerful testimony of how following Jesus can lead to a transformed life. As a disciple of Jesus, he witnesses countless miracles, hears profound teachings, and experiences the boundless grace and forgiveness of the Savior. This once ordinary tax collector becomes an instrument of God's grace. As he eventually writes the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew shares the life and teaching of Jesus with the world. Matthew's obedience in the face of feeling unprepared, which is many of us feel unprepared and unready, challenges us to consider our own response to God's call in our lives. Just like Matthew, we may also feel inadequate or unworthy of the task before us. But when we surrender to God's call, trusting in his divine wisdom and strength, we can turn our weaknesses into strengths and use us for his kingdom purposes. That is beautiful. In in Matthew's story, we find hope and encouragement to respond to God's call with open hearts and willing spirits. Regardless of our past, occupation, perceived limitations, Jesus invites each of us to follow him and to be transformed by his love and his grace. Like Matthew, let us leave everything behind and embrace the journey of faith, knowing that obedience to Jesus' call can lead us to a life of purpose, impact, and eternal significance. I got through these three stories, and I was telling my wife these stories, and I was like, man, Rebecca, it's going to be so good. I'm going to talk about Rebecca and disciples. You got to be ready. You got to be ready. And her first response was, ready for what? <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's where I'm going next, okay? Just, just relax, all right? Going for what? <laughs> Oops. Gave it away. Ready for what? There's three things we're going to get ourselves ready for. The alignment with God's will. Navigating life's challenges and fulfilling our calling. Those three things, if you just fell asleep and all the movie and everything, these three things is what you should understand. This is what you're getting ready for. This is why you are prepared for what you are going through in this life. Every single day. The alignment with God's will. Why is that important? We're picking up our cross and we're aligning with what he has for your life. Not what you want, what I want. We all know what we want, selfish. It's about us. We all know what you want. We're sinful in nature, but his will is perfect in every way. As much as you want to get ready for that event, that seven miles, you're not ready. You're not ready yet. You have to rely on the word of God every single day. You have to pray. You have to get outside, put your running shoes on when you don't have a seven-mile run. You got to put those running shoes on and go every day and prepare every single day. It's not a, I'm ready today. I'm going to do it today. You have to get ready. You have to work out. You can't just show up ready. You got to be ready every single day, preparing your heart for what God has for you, and you don't know what it's going to be. Maybe it's a storm. Maybe you're leading people through a storm we talked about last week with Paul. That doesn't mean you're not going to go through the storm. That just means you're going to be ready. We are aligning ourselves with God's will. Our next one is navigating life's challenges. Do you think Paul was excited? about the storms raging around him. He was not excited about that, but he knew the destination. He knew God's will. And then when there was life challenges, he was ready. Life is filled with uncertainties and challenges. When we are spiritually prepared, we have a firm foundation in our faith, which enables us to face trials with resilience, hope, and trust in God's promises. I don't know about you, but when I look at that picture, you can put that picture up there for me. Every single one, I don't know all of them. There's a few people that we don't know in the group. But the ones I look at right there were prepared for this moment. You know why? Because they were willing. They're willing to say yes. They're willing to go. And in order to be willing and ready to go, you have to be prepared. And they are prepared. And God is putting them through a storm right now. He's putting them through a storm right now. And we prayed for them. And it is an amazing thing. I asked Pastor Steve to send us a video 
Would you guys just watch this video from this morning, actually, in Niger? Good morning, Cornerstone. Hey, we are here in Niger. We're about to go into church, so we're way ahead of you guys. I wanted you to see us. We are alive and well and thriving. Uh, in fact, the Lord has opened up some, some greater doors of ministry to us. We appreciate your prayers. We miss you so much. Continue to pray for us. We're praying for you. Love you so much. Remember, you are love. God bless you guys. Yay! Come on. Hallelujah. Across the, the world. Finally, the third reason why we need to get ready is to fulfill our calling. We say, put it right here, make a difference. Fulfill our calling. What is our calling? What is that? What is that? What does that look like? It seems so obscure. What is this thing? Right there? They're fulfilling their calling right now. God has a new calling for you. There's somebody that, when I say there's somebody who's lost, there's somebody your heart sinks when they're not going to make it to heaven. That's your calling. There's somebody in this room that needs a friend. That's your calling. There's somebody at work that needs to know Jesus loves them. You know that. They don't know that. That's your calling. Your calling is the people around you. Act like Jesus would act towards them. That's your calling. Our calling, we want to fulfill. That's what we're getting ready for, is to fulfill our God-given mission with passion and conviction, making a significant impact for his kingdom. There's two ways we can do that. I'm going to give you two practical ways on your way out. Number one, to commune with God. Is it very clear? We say it, the word of God, it's like talking to him. It is talking to him. It's his words on paper. Commune with our heavenly father. You want to know his will? You want to know your calling? Commune with your heavenly father. The creator of the universe wrote down the plan, and you get to read it. That's the word of God, and it'll, tra it'll transform your speech. It'll transform your prayer. It'll transform who you are from the inside out. From the inside out. I'm going to use this example. Me and Logan working around the campus like crazy, and Nucci's gone, so I'm, I'm the, the, the workhorse around here. <laughs> but we, we were working on these buildings over here, and uh, there's rock. And we couldn't help but look at each other and go, man, that's on the inside of the inside. <laughs> what happens when we don't take care of the inside, the outside starts to rot. It starts to rot from the inside out. But when you're renewed from the inside out, man, the outside starts to look beautiful. This week, you're going to see some new painted buildings around here. You know why? You're going to see some new things happen. The fence, God is working on the inside. He's preparing us for a trip like this, to pray as a church, to come together, to pray for our, our school year, to pray for our teachers. God is preparing this place, and you get an opportunity to be a part of it by preparing and more importantly, number two, I want you to be willing. You can commune with God. You can know the word of God. But unless you're willing to say yes, I will, like Rebecca said, I will go. Jesus says, follow me. And they said, how far? Where are we going? They weren't ready. <laughs> They're fishermen. He's a tax collector. What, what, more far, what farther could it be? He built Rome with the taxes that he collected. That's, that's what oppressed the Jews. He helped the enemy. How can he follow Jesus? It does not matter your past, where you've been. God wants to renew you from the inside out so you can fulfill the calling that he has for you. Don't walk in fear anymore. Do not walk in the fear that is holding you back, that is stopping you from taking off. Use the passion that God has in you. Use who you are to, to, to shine the light of Jesus, to reflect to this world his love and his purpose. He wants to use you. He wants to use you. I can think of these interns. They have no idea what they're getting into. They have no idea. They just say yes. They say yes, I'll do it. Say yes to God. And I know this sounds like a big commercial, but man, Shane... We have an opportunity for you to say yes. Isn't that right? Small groups are kicking off very soon. Amen. And if you don't already say yes, say yes. I was taking, talking to Caetano. He said, I can't sign up for enough of these things. He said, I think I've got to say no to one of these. I have four, I'm signed up for four of them. God wants to use the people in this church, and they are. Somebody saying yes and leading those groups. Show up. Support them. Maybe you're going to say something. Maybe you're going to hear something, and God is going to transform you. Be ready 
for whatever God has for you. Be ready for the storms because they are coming. The storms are coming. If you're not ready, that video could be very different. That video could be very different. They could be hiding in a bunker going, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Church, pray for us. Now, Pastor Steve, we're ready. God's opening doors. We're preaching the gospel. God is working in and through us. That's our pastor. Come on. Come on. That's our church. And I'll leave you with this one last thought. Would you stand with me? i got to make up for all the extra time that Nick's been taking from you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'll leave you with this one last thought. Trusting in God's leading. Surrendering to him. Giving him your all. There are places that I cannot go because I don't work where you work. We don't want everyone to come be a pastor. We need to be the church outside the doors. We need to be outside the doors. Trusting God's leading, we can experience the joy of being used by him for his glory. I'll never forget this from Exodus. Is this my last slide? I'll go back to that in a second. God does not call the equipped, but he equips the called. I got to be honest with you. I looked that up because I was like, who said this? Who was the quote? I looked at it. I was like, oh, it's an exodus. That's awesome. <laughs> God's word is alive and it's speaking to every single one of you. Where is he calling you? The more you commune with him, the more it'll be clear. This is my calling. This is where I'm supposed to be. God does not call the equipped. It doesn't matter if you think you're ready. But our job is to be ready. That's our job. That's what we can control. But he equips the called. We want to be called today. I'm going to pray over you, and since I am supposed to be the piano player, I'm just going to go ahead and let you go after this. <laughs> We're not going to sing today, even though I would love to sing that song again. That was a powerful, powerful song. But let's pray that God will open our eyes to see what we are called to be. So when it comes time, we will be ready, putting our running shoes on every day, whatever that looks like. So many ways we can commune with the Father through our journaling. So Lord, I pray right now. I pray for Cornerstone. I pray for the direction. I pray that you would continue to prepare us for the weight of carrying the gospel. It is a heavy weight because we have the good news. But in reality, we have a bright light in a dark world. And it does not take very much light, Father, to make a dark room bright. Help us, Lord Jesus. Help us look towards the heavens where our help comes from to know that you are looking out for us, Jesus. Father, we love you. We want to know you more. We want to commune with you. So help us, Lord Jesus. I pray for their people. There's, there's people in this room who want to live out their calling. They don't know where to start. And so, Lord, I pray that they would start on their knees, praying to their heavenly Father. I pray that they would not be overwhelmed or fear-based or filled with fear, Lord Jesus, that you would break that off of them, Lord Jesus, so they will continue to run the race, Lord Jesus, that you have for us. We love you, Father, and we thank you that, you that we can hear from you today through worship, through announcements, through prayer, through offering, all these different types of worship, Lord. We worship you. We lift your name up on high today, and we come, Lord Jesus, and we say, I will. I will go. I will go. We thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. 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 Uh, praise God. I hope you feel equipped and ready. God bless you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs> and as you speak, a hundred billion families disappear. We lost your life, so I...